the church become uh, a part of that world in a very real way where there's fluidity, right? Uh, between those different realities, if you want, if you want. Yeah, and I'm, I'm seeing that in, in two ways already unfolding here. One is the, that I would name would be that there's a, uh, we've been talking a lot about trying to have more collaboration between the diocesan level and the local level. Uh, and that has had to happen hmm. because at the diocesan level, we don't have the juice to produce all this stuff. And so we're literally working kind of hand in hand with people uh, at the local level uh, to produce diocesan level stuff. We're sharing their local stuff. It's all, like you say, it's, it's integrated because we know that people in some ways don't care whether it comes from their parish or not. If it's right. good, they're going, they're, they're going for it. And, right. and so we want to then figure out how can we create stuff that is um, helping people grow and deepen in the faith and connect that up uh, across the diocese. And so it, it's, it's, while we are still concerned in some ways about local community, we're also now forced into a situation where there is so much more fluidity about who's on the team of creating diocesan resources and stuff. So that, that's the first piece. Yeah, yeah. Second piece is, I mean, I'm a brand new bishop, so I don't know what I'm doing anyway, but um, I have really been rethinking a lot of my assumptions about what I think a bishop is supposed to do and be because the, that's been forced, the innovation has been accelerated and yeah. forced the last two months. So I, I, I started doing virtual visitations a, a, about a month ago yeah. and, um, you know, kind of out of necessity. Te Texas is a big diocese. Rio Grande is a big diocese. Um, and, and, and so the normal visitation, which we sort of boiled down and said, it usually includes a, uh, you know, the Sunday liturgy, it includes a coffee hour, it includes a meeting with the vestry, it includes a meeting with the confirmands, yeah. Yeah. it yeah. includes a, a meeting with the clergy, right? So we've taken all five of those things, we're keeping the same visitation schedule, we're just doing it all virtually from yeah. here, using Zoom and then the switcher and all yeah. that kind of and, and, and then things start to happen. So the first time I, I had that meeting with the vestry, the, in the feedback at the end of that meeting, the senior warden said, Bishop, this may seem really weird, but um, you know, 18 months is a long time to wait for you to come and visit. And do you think you could do this with us like quarterly? Cause this has uh, been really, yeah, yeah. the penny sort of dropped like, oh right. The only reason we have visitation schedules kind of like that yeah. is because you can't be in more than one town in at a time, right? But I could have deeper connections with the vestries. I am having deeper connections with the clergy because of these these types of innovations. And then the next thing I did was the confirmation class. And I don't know if you have this experience, but sometimes I show up to meet with the confirmands and we sit down at the table and I say, so tell me about your confirmation preparation that's brought you to this point, right? And we're 45 minutes away from the laying on of hands, right? And, and they sort of sheepishly look around the room and go like, well, we showed up here today, Bishop. Like, that's the sum total. Yeah, of right. And I realized that, like, we have geographically dispersed delivery of Christian formation. Yep. Because it was necessary before. But I'm starting to wonder things like, would it be helpful for the bishop in collaboration with two or three different leaders across the diocese to do quarterly confirmation preparation so that if you're in a small church and it and it's hard for you all to get together or if you don't even live in the diocese but you want to participate in a confirmation prep thing why can we not create stuff that is more available not dependent on geography that would that would knit our our church life together and i'm yeah. not just let's create virtual communities that are never in person because I still believe the sacrament yes. is tangible and that our physical reality I mean Jesus became flesh right all of the early heresies are about confirming the fact that Jesus didn't just appear to be human he wasn't just playing a role that the intangible in the flesh was is the thing right so we and we're all yearning for that right that's why we're so mad about not yeah. being able to yeah. we need that so how can we make sure that the virtual online thing and the in-presence thing 
are seamless in a, in a way that, the, as you say, the digital natives already get. How do we do church like that? Well, and I think there's a piece here too, which is the, the whole, um, understanding the collaboration that can happen across the community in new ways. And in some way, it's like having that little spinner thing that Hermione has and, uh, yeah. Right. You know, you actually can film a Linton study, videotape of a Linton study that can be published online or used on a screen in a parish hall or whatever, and also hold uh, confirmation preparation and go to a vestry meeting all in the same week without booking your evenings up. And so right. that, that like all of a sudden you, you really do have this, ability to move through the space if you will kind of going back to that in a new way so here's my zinger for you because i didn't tell you i was going to ask you about this but i'm curious about how permaculture applies here right uh, yeah so just to i'm going to frame this for you and then let you run with it for a moment we can terraform this which is we can go in and make it comfortable for us as Christians uh, to exist in this space, which is kind of that, I, we're gonna go to Mars and make it habitable, right? So the, mm -hmm. the task is, or the tendency might be for us to come in and say, we're gonna terraform this space that we now have. But as Donovan reminds us in his, that great book about Christianity Rediscovered, our work really is permaculture. He doesn't say use that word, but my sense is that it's really about becoming a part of the fabric, right? So talk some about permaculture and how you think that might be adapted into this theological way of framing our missiological experience right now. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. <laughs> I didn't know you I was into permaculture. That's fabulous. So, so for those of you who don't know about permaculture, Permaculture is a style of uh, organic gardening that has its roots in the late 60s, early 70s in Australia and New Zealand, where the early practitioners of permaculture started looking at the way indigenous peoples managed landscapes and uh, realized that the kind of Western European idea of gardening means I take the row and I drive a straight line. I use right, I, I can't transform the environment to make it orderly, right? But indigenous peoples all over the world, here in the Southwest, in, in Australia, New Zealand, indigenous peoples uh, were not, uh, when, when Europeans arrived, they thought these people are just living in a paradise and they don't do anything. But what we now know by doing historic gardening is that indigenous peoples were very carefully working with their environment to transform that environment in a way that they and the environment were mutually beneficial with each other. And so permaculture is about creating a relationship with the natural environment where things that already want to grow are given the space to actually grow without us sort of saying, you have to grow here and I'm gonna bring stuff in from outside. I'm gonna pour fertilizer on this little tomato plant so it'll grow in a rock. Like that's the Western idea. All of our food system is based on, we're gonna bring in fertilizers, we're gonna bring in pesticides, drive things in straight rows so tractors can take over. All of that requires huge inputs from outside. And one of the key permaculture concepts is hard work is a failure of design. So permaculture is all about trying to pay attention and observe your environment, they say when you start a new permaculture project, you should observe the space for a year before you do anything. Because you need to see it in all seasons and all that sort of stuff. So observation is critical to permaculture. And then you're looking for what is, what is the space, what wants to grow in each space, and how do I link the functions of the things that are growing to create a mutually beneficial thing? And if I've thought carefully about that design, then it actually grows itself. Instead of needing lots of inputs, it doesn't need lots of outside help, it doesn't need lots of weeding or tending. So permaculture looks at weeds as helpful, not harmful. 
And, and so when I take those permaculture concepts, which, which by the way, right outside this window, I've got a sort of permaculture orchard that I'm, that I'm playing with and loving. When I take those permaculture concepts and apply them to the social project of design for a diocese, and it's about one for me, the realization that the Holy Spirit is always growing everything. Yes. Yes. God heals, God grows, God creates all the time. That's what weeds are. It's just the it's God creating stuff because there's space. So God puts weeds there. We'll grow something there. And that happens in church too. Stuff is always growing. But I think we, particularly church leaders, tend to uh, terraform it, right? I'm going to drive my row yeah. right through. Great example of that is how do we plan a new Bible study? You and I go, hey, I want to study the Gospel of John. Oh, that sounds good. What time are you free? I'm free on Tuesday night at 7. Okay, Tuesday night at 7, let's do the Gospel of John. We create that thing. Then we wonder why nobody showed up. And it's because we never observe the environment. We never ask the question, what are people hungry for? What are they yearning for? Where is God already growing something? And then we respond to the growth that God is putting into the system anyway, which requires a different sense of leadership, yeah, yeah. emphasis on listening, more observation, more like surfing the, surfing the Holy Spirit rather than leadership, you know? And, and so I think this is a huge moment for us with the crowdsourcing of materials, there is lots of life and growth happening right now in the church. And if we as leaders, as we move from phase one where the innovation is yeah. super, if we move into phase two with the idea like, okay, let's clamp this down, get it orderly, make it work, yeah. control it, then we're gonna kill it. Which is why you need all the pesticides and why you need all the fertilizers because you've taken too much control of what the Holy Spirit was going to do for you anyway. Yeah. Instead, we kind of look at what's growing. How, how is it working? Let's follow the Holy Spirit. Then I think that's about meeting Jesus where Jesus is already showing up in Galilee. Uh, it's really good. And I think it undermines a lot of our ideas about how to engage the next two years. Right. So, so uh, stepping back to be able to say, okay, so, we're going to begin to do this new thing, but how is, how is God out there muddling up this new thing? Where do we see this popping up and some new stuff happening? And how can we engage with God in that work there in that spot? And, uh, and being aware that 10 weeks doesn't reveal the fullness of what's happening in this new space that has emerged in front of us, right? So We are just now starting to figure out what is good about phase one and how to do it. And so we're hearing the, the growing pains of that, right? People are starting to really hunger for being back in you know, back in church, having communion, like we always used to do it. We, we, we are yearning for that because we remember it. It was only a couple weeks ago. But I don't think we really understand yet what yeah. new opportunities actually are. And so I'm really encouraging all of our churches, focus on phase one, people. Look at phase one. And in fact, we've, you know, my permaculture, it's about yeah. designing a process by which the, the natural growth is allowed to happen yeah. instead of trying to control. So what we've tried to do here is design the phase one workbook and process so that each congregation is taking the time to write down what they're actually doing in phase one and what's working and what isn't. And yeah. the idea there is to design a process whereby each parish's leadership has to stop and think, not how fast can we get out of this because we don't like it, it's different, but instead to sort of actually look at it and say, yeah. what resources did we move to make this happen and how did it work and what is blossoming and what's new? And I want them to identify all that stuff because we've got to not lose that innovation as we are able oh, to right. yeah. open our churches, right? So if we write it all down, send it to the diocese, then we share it, share everybody's answers with everybody else. And then you can start your phase two workbook after you've, after you've completed that. And again, it's about process. It's not about control. But I want to make sure that we take time to look at what is God doing that is growing and strengthening the church in phase one? 
so that as we start to lean into phase two, we can do the hard work of really imagining what the new, what the new growth yeah. will look yeah. like, you know? Yeah. And, well, and if we, what yeah. culture says is if we do this right, it grows itself. Yes, exactly. If we do this right, it doesn't require a lot of work. So clergy, if you're out there banging your head on the wall, working really hard to get stuff done. I mean, we're all working really hard. We're on Zoom all day right now. I get that. The design part is hard. But once it starts to grow, it should grow. The church should grow itself because it's the Holy Spirit. You know, God gives a growth. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's a wonderful way to end our conversation. And thank you for that. But I think uh, you've just kind of left us with this beautiful invitation that actually no matter where we are in the process, it's never too late to kind of pause and take in the, the, our surroundings and to really see what's happening, uh, where we are, and, and, and what's been happening over the last 10 weeks uh, and creating that space for reflection and discernment, really. And, and that's, uh, so thank you for that. And thanks for playing a little bit uh, on the permaculture thing, because I think it's, uh, you know, it's always good to have a concept that isn't our own, that doesn't, we don't possess, to reflect and bounce off ideas. So thank you. And thanks for joining me today, Michael. I really appreciate it. It's great to be with you. This has been really fun, my brother. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.